Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young. Been a lot of Drew and I lately. D.Y.'s been all over the place, but he's here today because we've got uh, some important business to discuss, and that would be just how dangerous the K-State offense might be in 2024. And I, I want people to also remember this. This was already going to be an offense that had pretty high expectations and could do a lot of impressive things in 2024 before they added Dylan Edwards because – we know that Avery Johnson's your quarterback. DJ Giddens has proven to be one of the better running backs in the Big 12, a league which, by the way, last year might have been the best running back conference in the country when you consider the fact that they had Ollie Gordon, they had Jonathan Brooks at Texas, they had Devin Neal at KU, and DJ Giddens was right there in the mix with all of those guys. And we talked about it at one point during last season. I think K-State faced like – seven or eight running backs that finished in the top 15 and rushing in the country last season. That's a testament to what they saw in the big 12, but they also, you know, Troy contributed to that a little bit. So did Missouri, but we saw a lot of good running backs last year and there's, there was no way to discern that, Hey, that guy is significantly better than DJ Giddens. Well, so you have those guys in the fold. Now you bring Dylan Edwards in who can do a lot of different things for you. Not to mention the fact that, the optimism for wide receiver, I know it's there almost every year if you're a K-State fan. Uh, we, we talked about it on the Sunday show a couple weeks ago when we were doing uh, like the spring ball legends, like, oh, this guy's going to be good, and then he didn't do anything. Wide receiver is always that key position, but it does feel like there's some legitimate juice to what K-State has at that spot this year. So with the addition of Dylan Edwards and how everything stands, D.Y., have, have your expectations for the offense elevated higher than what it was probably – you know, a month and a half ago when we started talking about this? Absolutely. Uh, the, there's a level of explosiveness that was lacking last year and was probably going to be remedied to an extent this season just because of the presence of Avery Johnson under center more often. <laughs> you know, perhaps the continued development and maybe emergence of Keegan Johnson uh, just didn't occur last year. You want to think Jace Brown be, continues his upward trajectory. DJ Ginn's terrific back, maybe the best one in the Big 12 in general, uh, or at least up there, you know, in the Big 12, up there nationally. Probably not known to be an explosive guy, but clearly a dangerous weapon um, besides the point on offense. And now you add in, you know, a top five, top ten home run hitter in college football. I know that hasn't bared itself out yet because of the, the limitations that he had at Colorado um, and just not doing really anything substantial outside of the TCU game. But I, th I think we could probably pin that a lot on an offense without an offensive line, more so catered to Shadur Sanders than anything. So, uh, you know, that's not – uh, negatively impacting my perception of Dylan Edwards. I still see him as, you know, he, he'll probably have to battle consistency a little bit, I would imagine, in Manhattan. But I still consider him one of the big, more explosive playmakers in all of college football. You know, I, I said it, you know, when he was signing with Colorado, you know, after being committed to both Kansas State and Notre Dame in that specific class, he might have been the most explosive player. And, that, and I keep saying explosive. Like, he's just fast in general. But the explosiveness is really what catches my eye. And you look at the, you know, Kansas State schedule, and it's a tricky one, really, um, just because you have all your Big 12 games. You're playing Arizona as a non-con. You're playing Tulane on the road as a non-con. But this is, you know, co consistency will – dictate if it's the best offense that I've covered at Kansas State, but it is definitely, I would say, the most dangerous and explosive offense that I've covered at Kansas State, and they're doing it in a year where they're not automatically lesser talented than two teams on the schedule in Texas and Oklahoma that aren't there. Like, And I know people are going to roll their eyes. Texas and Oklahoma were always was always more talented than Kansas State, and everybody knew that before the season started. Didn't mean they were always going to be better, but they were going to be more talented. There's not two definite teams now on the schedule more talented than Kansas State. 
Yeah, I mean, that's that, that's the number one place to start. And I think that's where a lot of people talk in this new Big 12. They've, they've handpicked a handful of teams that make sense to be pretty consistent powers or at least battling for a spot in the Big 12 title game. K-State and Oklahoma State were incumbents from the original Big 12. Utah, and then Arizona. Utah and Arizona figure into that based on their trajectory. And I really don't think that like it's insane right now with what Lance Leipold's doing that KU probably feels like they need to be in that mix. Quarterback then, health. Yep. Yeah, That'll and then I, I think elsewhere, like you kind of have to see it where Chris Kleiman's been at K-State now for he's, – he's coached five seasons. So we know what Chris Kleiman can do. We know that this is what it's going to look like. The floor in a full season for Chris Kleiman at K State has been eight wins. Um, now That's you've had the, the COVID yeah. year. The, I I don't count it. There are so many times that we can look at it and see. Okay, uh, Wichita State played one that their conference basketball, and they they went to the NCAA tournament. Well, yeah, then they fired Isaac Brown a year later, and all I think- these. There's so many other outliers in that year. So COVID doesn't count, but outside of that, he's consistent. I think TCU fans would probably try to argue that, hey, we should be in the mix because of the one national title game appearance. That should not take away from what TCU did there. But then we saw year two for Sonny Dykes. There were a lot of issues. So, like, that's got to be proven. Texas Tech, same thing like KU. Keep a quarterback healthy and actually prove that you can do it as opposed to being the offseason darlings of the league. So I think there's four or five teams that you look at and you say, hey, they're going to consistently be at the top if as things currently sit, and K-State is one of those. Yep. You, you named – the top four with KU being in that category of Jalen Daniels remains healthy um, to be the fifth. And then you mentioned two teams that have the ability and the upward recruiting style to do it. One having already done it and then completely imploding afterwards. That's TCU and Texas tech. I would throw another one in there. I think UCF, I, 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 I would put them in that TCU Texas Tech category as a team that can maybe uplift themselves into that stratosphere, so to speak. But uh, yeah, I guess going back to it, if you <laughs> excuse me, if you combine the upside and potential of the Kansas State offense and how dangerous they can be, not saying they will be, how dangerous they can be because of the weapons that they now now have and how they can really do some interesting wrinkles because of it too with Giddens and Dylan Edwards. You combine that with a schedule that doesn't automatically have two teams that were going to be more talented than you every single season. And this is certainly a team that could probably break some records and be pretty special. Some of that might be dependent on pace and, and what that looks like under Connor Riley and Matt Wells, but it's not hard to envision going to Las Vegas for Big 12 Media Days in July, the three of us, you, uh, you, I, and Drew, and everyone there is talking that Kansas State's probably the favorite. Yeah, I think I think it seems like a or almost Utah, like a likelihood at this point. Yeah, Utah will get that. Here's the thing, though. Like, we're talking about quarterback health. I've seen Jalen Daniels and, uh, you know, whoever you wh- whoever's going to be one of the four quarterbacks Tech plays this year. I've seen them all play a football game more recently than Cam Rising. And that was like week one last year. It was like, oh, Cam Rising, is he going to play? He might. And then it was like every week until like week 12, they're like, yeah, he's not going to play. So I don't know what mysterious injury he's got going on out there. But like that's another one where I don't think people should automatically hop on the Utah wagon because – I think a lot of their success is dependent on Cam Rising because we saw the quarterbacks behind him last year were nothing special. Yeah, to be fair, Utah, because they're they're so well coached, still figured it out in spite of Cam Rising. So, and now they're compared to maybe the Pac 12 last year, like the one time it was really good. And they're probably going to have a softer schedule, so to speak, as well. They're not going to play a team, I don't think as talented as Oregon was last year. I'll put it that way. Um, And something like that. Another wrinkle to, to, uh, to consider is Kansas State and Utah don't play Joe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that both teams benefit from that. And then Arizona, another team that we threw into that mix, Arizona and K-State aren't a conference game with each other. So there's a, yeah. So there's a realistic opportunity there that, Hey, uh, you would end up meeting them again, possibly based on how things could work out. So that's, 
kind of the, the bigger picture stuff as we, we focus it in a little bit more. We'll talk about some of the individual players, but probably the, the next place that we should go is talking about how the addition of Dylan Edwards now impacts the marriage at offensive coordinator between Connor Riley and Matt Wells, two guys that I think since each of them got their respective titles has done a really good job. So Connor Riley dating back to the pop tarts bowl and Matt Wells, since basically the second he got on campus, where do you see things going for how they handle this offense now? You know, I'll probably take what the two said in press conferences as gospel at the moment, because it's really all we have. You know, we see first parts of a few spring practices. We saw the Pop-Tarts Bowl, which probably wasn't an exact reflection of how things will look just because you're doing that on three or four weeks. And we haven't seen a game. And we don't know how much influence Matt Wells will have. We don't know how much, how similar it will look to Colin Klein. There's a lot of open-ended questions that we don't have the answers to. What I would say is, you know, I'm projecting balance, the run in the pass game. Uh, you know, I, I remember Matt Wells saying throw to score, run to win. I think it's just to like be explosive, get the ball in your playmaker's hands, you know, score fast, be, you know, be electric, um, and then pound, pound teams after you've worn them down for three quarters. That's kind of almost how I envision it. Um and, and how I envision Dylan Edwards, and I've, I've gotten some pushback on this, but but I'm pretty confident and insistent that this is how it will kind of look. I don't, I don't think you're looking at a guy that's going to get 10-plus carries every single game. I don't. I, I think there's, there's a DJ Giddens back there, and I don't see his role and usage changing a whole lot. I see Edwards getting a Trayshawn Ward amount of carries perhaps or – even less than that, like it wouldn't surprise me if we're talking eight to 10 carries a game, sometimes over, sometimes less. And then another, what, five to seven targets in the passing game to to utilize them that way. I, I'll put it this way. Dylan Edwards will probably line up at slot receiver much more than we saw Trayshawn Ward. Yeah, so, I mean, there, that's that's one of the things that I I was probably most interested in and what you thought is, how will they utilize DJ Giddens and Dylan Edwards together? Because, I mean, we didn't see it a ton last year. Uh, and even, you know, when Deuce and DJ were there together, they weren't on the field a ton to, at the same time. Do you anticipate that this might be the most we've ever seen two running backs on the field for K-State at the same time this coming season? Yeah, and, and it might look at times – because he's going to get lined up all over the field. Like, I, you know, folks are going to be like, is Dylan Edwards a running back? All purpose back, probably. Mm -hmm. um, a more accurate description. But, like, I, it would shock me if you didn't see it much more than we have in the past, right? So, you know, you could see Dylan, because of his explosiveness, because of his speed, is dangerous with the ball in his hands. He's going to be used in that way. The boy can be used as a decoy too. You imagine El Edwards sprinting across yeah. the the field in jet motion. How much do the defense has to go with him, or just that you get a couple linebackers of safety to take one bad step, and now you got DJ Giddens with a ton of space, or someone, or Avery Johnson with a ton of space. I mean, yeah. it's it, in ways that it won't be fair. Like defenses will get smart, um, they'll adjust, and Kansas State will adjust. But at first. I mean, there's a lot of pick your poison, and you can really play with the defense's eyes just by the way you're you're moving and running around Edwards. Drew and I talked about this some, but in, in some ways, do you think that the addition of Dylan Edwards actually means that we might see more Avery Johnson running this coming season than originally thought just because there's that added wrinkle? So if you have him on the field, it's another really talented runner that teams have to account for. And maybe there is a way that using Avery Johnson's legs more, he's going to take less hits or it's going to be a little bit more safe for him than what would have been originally imagined if it was just him and DJ Giddens as the real run threats. Yeah, he's definitely probably going to have much more cleaner and, and safer space to operate in. So it wouldn't shock me if, if this causes maybe a tiny bit of an uptick, but he's definitely someone that still wants to – uh, you know, use that arm as well. Uh, so from a 
practical X's and O's standpoint, you're correct because of the additional space that he's going to have to maneuver um, and, and won't be like tough runs, right? We're, we're talking, we're not talking physical runs so that those are good things, but just from a, you know, kind of an Avery standpoint too. He's not someone that wants to be pounded into the ground. The type of runs could change. We'll put it that way. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's get into some of the, the individuals and how that will impact things because this is, I mean, the way it's shaping up, the, the offense was really good under Colin Klein, probably the best of the climbing uh, era, both, both of the seasons that we saw at 2022 and 2023, you were around for, you know, since 2017, uh, is this going to be, or on paper, should this be the best offense K-State's had from a production standpoint, this 2024 season in the, you know, eight seasons you've been here now? It should. Um, now the numbers, I don't know exactly how it'll look because pace could influence the numbers in everything. But in terms of just success, if they falter even a little bit, um, everybody falters a little bit. If they if they ever go through like a rough patch, like a real rough patch, something's wrong because that's that's uh, too much talent to not be getting something right and you got you know those guys on the screen i i think the two guys that probably benefit the most from the addition of dylan edwards is keegan johnson and garrett oakley because those two also have plenty of upside and potential to be explosive in their own right due to their own athletic ability and potential um it just hasn't come together for him yet mostly oakley because he was you know working behind ben Sinnott. it was a second round nfl draft pick and keegan johnson just had a you know, a first year growing pains, I think, in Kansas State and wasn't healthy. If he gets healthy and really starts to play fast, and those two with their, like I said, their upside, their ability to be dangerous as well. People haven't seen it, but they can certainly do it. And they're going to get the exact matchups and be put in just ideal situations to really take off if they're ready to do it. Because you got to think with the, the with the you know the threats in the backfield being DJ Giddens, a 1,200-yard rusher, one of the best backs in the Big 12. Dylan Edwards, one of the most explosive players in the country. Avery Johnson, one of the most explosive players in the country. You had Jace Brown, a receiver, which teams are now aware of because of how he finished the last season. There's just going to be so much opportunity there for Keegan Johnson and Garrett Oakley. Yeah, and I, I also think we saw in games where Avery Johnson was on the field uh, I think Keegan Johnson kind of started to, to pop a little bit more of the last half of the year. You mentioned health being a part of that. And yeah, Garrett Oakley, I mean, he he certainly should be considered with all of these guys. It's just we haven't seen him yet. So what's it going to look like actually out there? But basically all of these guys, it's it's a pretty friendly relationship where they're all going to give a little but also get a little from their teammates because Garrett Oakley benefits from the fact that you have I mean, three guys that at this point we think and know that really no matter what happens can be explosive. That'd be Giddens, Edwards, and Brown, Avery being the quarterback. I won't throw him in that mix. But then Keegan Johnson, I think we saw kind of turn a corner. There are a lot of things that he can do here. And then Dante Cephas is kind of the wild card, but he was highly sought after when he left Kent State. He went to Penn State last year, You know, ha had some moments, but probably would have liked for it to be better. He's got a better quarterback this year at, at K-State than he did at Penn State, though. And so that'll be fascinating to see how it plays out. And I think the the opportunity for what these guys can do is pretty significant. And, I, I mean, we've talked about the, the Big 12 expectations ever since, you know, the, the schedules got aligned and everything else. But it does feel like even though this team is going to be led by a sophomore quarterback and your top receiver is also probably a sophomore and all of these different things where youth might get in the way, first year offensive coordinator, all of that stuff, it's really hard to not paint a picture where K-State isn't at least playing for the Big 12 title in Arlington given what they have in front of them, barring you know significant injury of any kind. But this is just a team, it's loaded right now. And I think this is one of those where 
you'll start to get some of those like anonymous quotes from coaches before the season or during the season. And somebody will say that like, yeah, the K-State offense just isn't fair because you start with those guys in the backfield. It's just, it's, it's an embarrassment of riches. And then you take into consideration that we know their speed with Brown and Johnson. And if those three receivers take a step forward, you're golden. And we know the staff loves Garrett Oakley. I mean, that you're going to throw a ton of guys on the field that have serious potential. Absolutely. And, and not to look ahead, but I, but I already did because, you know, we just had the NFL draft and three guys got taken. It was Cooper, BB, Ben Sinnott and KT Leviston. And I was like, man, what, what's K-State having the 25 draft? And, and it might be less than that. It's because the only ones that came to my mind were one of the guys on the screen there and DJ Giddens and Marcus Siegel. And then I was going through it. They got plenty of dudes. They'll be like the 2025 roster for Kansas state might be the, assuming everyone stays that can stay. Um, Cause you're probably going to have some unfortunate surprises, maybe some good surprises, but that 2025 roster at case state may be the, it, it, it has the potential to be the best one that I've covered. So that that's the interesting thing is 25 is setting up to be even more, spe- even more special, assuming that everyone does return. And, and, and I, and I thought that going into 22 and that's when they won the big 12. So uh, they can win the big 12 and 24 just because of the way the league is now too. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you got the dudes now ready, ready to go. Don't get me wrong, but <laughs> They are more primed for 25. All right. The last thing that, that I'll leave with here, and we'll, this will take us back to the, the offensive coordinators because this will be the interesting thing. I, I sent a message the other day, and I was like, man, the, those guys are the luckiest dudes in the world right now where their first year in this situation, Matt Wells is back as, a, as an offensive coordinator. He obviously eventually wants to get back to being a Power 5 head coach. He's Power 4 probably. Connor Riley, first chance at being the OC, all of this stuff. It seems like a great position for them to have all these talented guys we've talked about. But in any way, does this add more pressure to these guys going into the 2024 season now that – and there was already a lot because you're working with Avery Johnson who could end up being the most talented quarterback that's ever played at K-State and certainly has the most fanfare of a quarterback that's ever played at K-State. And then you factor in DJ Giddens, who Drew was talking about, like he's he's already like in the top 10 and all time rushing at K-State. Like there's so many records that DJ Giddens could set this year. We know how good he is. Obviously, Dylan Edwards, another guy, a lot of fanfare because he's a Kansas kid and because he's this big time transfer and then everything else. Like as fun as it might be for those guys right now, how much pressure is there going into this season for them? Quite a bit. And and you painted the picture, you know, probably better than I could, but the they're not going to get the benefit of a like a runway here of to ease into this. Like they're going to be expected right out of the gate to be dynamite offensive coordinators. Essentially, Matt Wells hasn't been an offensive coordinator in quite a while. Connor Riley's hasn't been one or a primary play caller ever. So. But they're going to be expected to produce and perform like play callers in their 10th year just because of the toys that they're blessed with. Um, So to your point, all of this is definitely a blessing, but in ways a curse. Yeah, we'll see how it ends up working out for the two of them. But just one of those things that my initial reaction was, man, these guys are just blessed with what they have. But there's going to be an incredible amount of pressure on these guys. So I think it'll be interesting to see how they navigate it and how they speak on it, Uh, obviously, when we get back into August. Matt Wells could be the key just because he has done it before. He's going like I don't think either of these guys lack confidence, but Matt Wells might be like the most aggressively confident guy that I've ever heard speak uh, as a coach at K-State. And Chris Kleiman is, is very good about that, too, like, when Chris Kleiman's feeling it, he's feeling it. But Matt Wells, he's got he's got somewhere to go with what he's saying, and he knows he's going to get there in the right amount of time. Like he's not worried about it. You could tell when when we because we've been around Kleiman long enough. You you could 
tell when he's kind of feeling it because he'll crack and get out of character for a brief moment and like yeah try, kind of be cocky yeah almost. so because he's talking about dj being turned and, and all this stuff like um it's funny you could tell 98 percent of the time climbing is the same and that's what probably makes him a special head coach but there's that one percent where he cracks and gets kind of cocky about it which is kind of fun to watch and there's one percent too where you could tell he's just absolutely pissed at the freaking world too yeah yeah, yeah, we we've seen that a couple times. Uh, the the Texas game, I think, uh, a couple of year, two years ago, and then Iowa this State. past year Iowa State. Yeah, that I re, I think that was the most upset that I'd ever seen him after a game. And like he's normally, I think, really good at hiding that stuff. But that one, it was like it, he was so upset about it that he he didn't. I don't think he cared that it came through in that no. situation. So. Uh, that we'll, we'll see how it goes with this offense though. It would appear that Chris Kleiman won't have to have too many press conferences like that in 2024. We'll have more on K state football throughout the week right here on KSO head over to kstateonline.com. Get your recruiting news for basketball and football because the portal is still open. It closes tomorrow. So keep an eye on that. Now guys can still commit K state will still be working on dudes. But they also got a high school commit, their second one of the class of 25 yesterday. Uh, Drew and I will have more on that, so you can find that on the KSO YouTube as well. Plenty of things going on, so K-State Online is your home for all the K-State news and information you want. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. We're out of here. Thanks for watching K-State Online.